Hey there, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. We are so honored that you would join us today. We hope you enjoy this message and we pray that it helps you see Jesus clearly through it. Uh, we're going to jump into Titus chapter 1 this morning and we're going to walk through verses 1 through 7. And over the course of the next uh, couple of months, uh, several weeks, we are going to be walking through from Titus 1 1 to the end of chapter 3. And we're calling this series Church Planting 101. And uh, for those of you who maybe are unfamiliar, Anchor Church is a church plant. We are just getting going, just getting moving. Our goal is COVID uh, allowing that in the fall, in September, we full on launch, that we are functioning uh, in all the ways you would expect a church to function. And uh, we are, we're building towards that. But we are a brand new church. This is a church plant. And so uh, we're, we're calling this, this series Church Planting 101 because this is a, a letter from the Apostle Paul written to Titus, who is a church planter, that he has been given the assignment to build this initial church on an island called Crete. It is a Greek island. And look up some images. It's a gorgeous place. Uh, it, it's this island off of uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, off of Greece, and they are known amongst the whole world, but even self-identifying, you see their own authors, as Tucker talked about last week, labeling themselves as liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. And this is where Paul says, Titus, we traveled here together. I'm going to go preach the gospel elsewhere. I'm going to leave you here to raise up these liars, these, these cruel animals, and these lazy gluttons to build the church. Uh, so this is what he has been commissioned to do. And uh, so he outlines briefly and bluntly, these are the expectations. This is the task I'm leaving you with to raise up the local church to operate and function properly. And what we see is this church plant needed to be taught some basics about church leadership, needed to be uh, taught some basics about foundational doctrines and how to have proper order within the church community. This is uh, something that, that Titus was instructed to do, not just in one local church, but this was in various towns on the island. He was to raise up leadership to self-sustain the church in all of these different towns. And so this is not a letter saying, Titus, this is specifically just, just your responsibility to lead the church. Uh, although this is written to Titus, and it is explaining the priorities for this church planter, for this church leader, what we find in this is this is what the local church is supposed to look like. This is how the, the local leaders are to be raised up. And this is the, the, the tone I want to take into the series. This is not written to the people who are employed uh, at Anchor Church. This is to the body. How we are to, to focus on doctrine and on order and on leadership. And how do we function as a community to be self-sustaining? How do we raise up leaders? One of our core values is empowerment that we are building a church that outlasts us? How do we recognize that I'm not just coming here to, to be ministered to, but I'm coming to Anchor Church to be a part of the ministry? We just exited a series called Suit Up where we use the phrase over and over that you are a soldier, hoping to ingrain within you that you recognize regardless of how long you've been following Jesus, you are enlisted in the battle and you are are a soldier. I don't want to leave that, but now I want to add to that in this series. Not only are you a soldier, but you are a leader. That you are a minister. That, that ministry is not isolated to those who have been uh, gone through Bible college and are employed at a church. You are a minister of the gospel. You are a leader at Anchor Church. And I want to say this, that God brought you to be a part of this community at this specific time with purpose. Because we are in the building stages. We are in the stages of, of raising up leaders, of establishing what structure looks like. And if God wanted you to just attend and be ministered to alone, he would have waited till after September to bring you. But you're here now in this season where we are raising up a culture, we are raising up a leadership, and you are here now because he sees you as a leader in this church. Regardless of how long you've been attending, how long you've been following Jesus, I believe you are here with purpose. And yes, I hope this church absolutely ministers to you. It ought to. Your church ought to feed you and help you grow and encourage and inspire you. But you are not here just to be ministered to. You are the minister. 
I want you to believe this. I want you to know this. I want you to feel this as we walk through this series, that you are not just a soldier. You are a part of the work of ministry, that we are here to raise up leaders. And what we see uh, is this early church needed um, some clarity on order, on leadership, and on doctrine. This, this was what was important. I want to tell you, uh, much of church, especially in the early stages, especially in church planting stages, is working on these. It's working on doctrine, it's working on order, and it's working on leadership. And we are going to see clearly in this that we are called as a community to identify, to have clarity on these issues. What do we believe? Know what we believe and stick to it and don't let false doctrines uh, sustain in here. Like we, we don't just let, this isn't a free-for-all on what we believe. There should be order and clarity in what you believe. There should be clarity on order, on, on leadership, on uh, authority structures. That it shouldn't just be ambiguous uh, free-for-all that people can just say and do and behave in whatever way. No, there needs to be accountability. There's supposed to be authority. There's supposed to be structure. Know what you believe. Know how you operate and stick to it. I want to tell you, this is a, a lot of what we've been working on over the course of the last six or eight months. Um, we spent a lot of time as, as a, a leadership team working on a, a statement of faith, making it very clear the, 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 what we believe in. And if you haven't seen our statement of faith, it, it's on our website. We want to make it very clear what we believe. We don't want you to start coming to Anchor Church and in six years or, or a few months later, you start discovering, oh, I didn't recognize that this is what this, this community believed in. We want you to know straight, straight up front, this is what we believe, this is what we stand for. So we worked really hard, tirelessly on every word of what our statement of faith is. And we've worked really extensively on establishing proper authority structures, especially since we are not a part of a denomination that comes with some inherited authority structures and accountability structures. We've worked really hard on what our structure looks like and, and the levels that, that go from, you know, we've got uh, a, a board of directors and we've got, uh, we've got uh, our elders and we've got overseers and we've got pastors and we've got members and, and how these all relate together. And we spent a long time working hard on what, uh, not just our, our statement of faith, but what our bylaws are and, and what this looks like and how does this operate. And now those huge tasks that we're going to continue to operate under uh, have been fulfilled. It's now time to turn and say, okay, how do we build up leadership? leadership within the body. We've got authority structure. We've got clarity in what we believe. We need to stick to those. We don't just let them go now. We hold on to those. And now we build a team. We build leaders. And you are here. Whether live or online, it's time that we invest and we build leadership within this church. So we're going to jump into Titus 1.1. Verses 1 through 4 is uh, kind of an introduction. And then we're going to jump into this, this second section. Uh, so we kind of get a two for one here today. But we're going to start with Titus chapter 1 starting in verse 1. It says, this letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. I have been sent to proclaim faith to those who God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. So Paul essentially gives his personal mission statement here. He says, uh, I've been called to, one, proclaim faith, that he is going to share the gospel that, that produces faith inside of, of humanity. He says, I'm here first and foremost. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach the gospel. I'm going to declare faith. I'm going to declare hope in Jesus. But he gives this important second part. He says, and beyond that, yes, I will preach the gospel, but and I will teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. That, that uh, we see this consistently through Paul's teaching, that he, he, he leads with the gospel. He leads with grace. He leads with faith all the time. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and now because of the gospel, because grace has entered your life, because faith is stirring up, it always then translates into behavior. You read the books, you guys that are walking through Ephesians, you can see it. The first three chapters are layered with the gospel. And then the second three chapters are layered with how the gospel ought to affect your daily life. That Paul is, is very clear that his purpose is first, declare the gospel. Let people know the grace of God. But then I'm not going to leave it there. I will follow up with the second half of the purpose is teaching them the truth that will lead them to godly living. 
that there is behavior that needs to be discussed, but we must be very clear the order that this comes in. The danger comes when we see that the behavior, the good works, the godly living, is what we do in order to receive God's grace or in order to, to, to prove our faith. Good works are a part of this, but it is grace that leads to faith that leads to good works. That all three are important in, in a believer. If we're following Jesus, we receive grace, it produces faith, and the fruit of that is good works. We can't just leave one of them out. That if we just don't talk about works, we don't talk about behavior, and our behavior isn't changing, we're not growing in, in holiness, then something is missing in the equation because grace always leads to faith, always leads to changed behavior. So we can talk about changed behavior, but not without leaving out grace and the faith that leads us there. We, we, we need to handle all three appropriately, but we need to keep them in the proper order. Paul makes it very clear. It is grace, produces faith, produces good works. We see it with Jesus. He's not afraid to tell people, go and sin no more. But he leads with, neither do I condemn you. He leads with grace. This grace produces faith. And then he says, now stop sinning. Stop living this way. Let it change the way that you live. So Paul is saying, this is my purpose. This is my passion. I want to say, as a church, our goal is first and foremost to get the gospel of Jesus into this community. Let people know the hope of Jesus. But we also want to be faithful to say, and teach them the way that this truth ought to produce a lifestyle of godliness. What does it mean when we receive the grace of God? We have faith in Jesus. Now can we get down to the more uncomfortable part of if that is true, it ought to affect the way that you're living. This is more difficult for us to talk about, but Paul makes it very clear that this is his passion. Here's a phrase we're going to use a lot in the next couple of months. Gospel truth leads to godly living. Write it down if you're taking notes. Gospel truth leads, always leads to godly living that we want to speak the gospel truth. And we don't want to just preach godly living. This is not uh, just a behavior modification opportunity. This is saying, no, we believe that we ought to be changing, and the way to get there is gospel truth. We focus on the gospel. We see the grace of God. It produces faith, and it will lead to godly living. Now, what we see, Paul, in this culture and what he's commissioned Titus to, to face, which is still extremely prominent across the globe and in our culture for, year, for, for sure today, is Paul has to address two different kinds of errors, immature understandings of grace, or false teachings about grace. And these two kinds of errors are still prevalent here today, and maybe if we're honest, we'll see one of them arise even in our own thinking. These two errors are first, legalism, and the second one is licentiousness. Legalism is having to do with, with law, with rules, with you just, it, it's all about these laws and these rules and following this behavior. Licentiousness is where we get the word license. It's this, it's this license, it's this freedom, it's this ability to live a certain way. And both of these are harmful. Legalism is, is that you are earning the grace of God through human effort and accomplishment. This often looks like a very strict, dry living. Often it's accompanied by arrogance, by judgment, by comparison of who I am versus who you are. Um, to be honest, legalism often shows its face as just a super boring stick in the mud who's just saying bad, 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 bad. This is the, the most common form of legalism is I'm going to compare and, and, and rank. And it's all about performance-based and life is no fun, but how cool that I have higher standards than you. This is, this is legalism. Licentiousness swings the pendulum way to the other side, and it says that grace means I don't have to worry about my behavior. Because God is so good, he's so forgiving, that uh, he'll always accept me back, he'll always forgive, and it leads more to a, a reckless, rule-free living. That I don't have to worry about standards, I don't have to worry about behavior, because God's grace is, is good. Legalism says, well, you're not really a Christian, you're not really mature if you continue to use that language, watch that type of show, drink that certain substance, and, and it just says your, your, your faith is based on your works, that, that, that you're not really a Christian if you don't follow all of these rules. Licentiousness, on the other hand, says, well, you're not really a mature Christian if, if you don't recognize the freedoms you have to, to, to you know, have some coarse joking, to, to drink this much, or to, to watch that, whatever the, 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 the category you want to place it in. Licentiousness says you're not mature if you don't understand you have the freedom to do those things, and, and so you're not mature if you've got these high standards. 
These are, are damaging. Romans 6, 1, uh, it says it this way. Paul himself, he writes Romans, and he's just, just demonstrated the gospel, laid it out so clearly. God's grace is so good. And then in Romans chapter 6, he says, well, because God's grace is so good, he says, what should we say then? Shall we go on sinning? Should we just keep sinning so that God's grace may increase? He says, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that when you were united with Christ, you were buried with him in baptism and raised back to life? Where's my valid Christian alumni that memorized Romans 5, 6, and 7? Yeah, there we go. Uh, It's still there a little bit. I think I got a few words wrong. Uh, But it's just this call of God's grace is so good. Does that mean we should just keep on sinning because he'll always take me back? No, that's not the way that you respond to love and to grace. You have a spouse who will always take you back regardless of your behavior and your unfaithfulness. That love ought to draw you to, well, I want to honor that kind of love and commitment to me, not a license to go live however I want and damage this relationship. No, it's, it's drawing us closer because of the love and the grace that has been given to me. Legalism seeks to earn the grace of God. Licentiousness tries to take advantage of it. Legalism feeds on the pride of my flesh. Licentiousness feeds on the lusts of the flesh. And both are destructive. And Paul sees this and says, Titus, this is a big challenge you have. And if we look at our culture today, if we look at the Western church today, it's the battle we still face of those that err on the side of legalism. And those that err on the side of licentiousness, both are destructive, but the answer to both is the gospel. The gospel truth that leads to holy living. The gospel leads us to proper balance. Gospel truth leads to godly living. That's our goal, Paul's mission here, and our goal as a church. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you know me very well, these are like my life verses. Uh, it just is, chapter 11 is just talked about all these heroes of our faith uh, who lived great faith, demonstrated great faith, died in great faith, and it says that they are now all cheering us on in our race of faith. It, it, it talks about our life, illustrates it as a race. And it says uh, in Hebrews 12, 1, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by this huge crowd of witnesses to our faith, it says, let us, uh, let us strip off, here, I got it right here, it says, uh, let us strip off every weight that slows us down especially the sin that so easily trips us up and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. It says let us, let us run with endurance. Let us be as effective and efficient as we can in this life that we have. And because we want to be effective and efficient, it says some good strategies for efficiency is to take off any weight that's slowing you down. If you're about to go run a race, it's not a good idea to pack on the extra weight, to wear some backpacks, carry some dumbbells. It's not going to help you be effective. You take off the weight so that you can run effectively. It says especially sin that so easily trips us up. Like, if you got obstacles on your course, or if you got ropes tied around your legs, you're not going to be very effective. Not because you're not trying hard, not giving the same effort, but because of the weight and the ropes and the obstacles, it hinders the effectiveness. And so we are told here that we are to both remove the weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Meaning we ought to be talking about sin. We ought to be recognizing the sin in our own lives. because not, not because God's grace isn't there to forgive sin. Not because our faith in Jesus hasn't saved, uh, given us salvation and hope for eternity. But because that sin is still preventing me from living the most effective, efficient, influential life on this earth. So I may be forgiven, but I'm ineffective. And so it says cut off that sin. Get rid of that sin so you can run with endurance and be the most efficient and effective. So we ought to be talking about sin, dealing with sin, recognizing sin, being honest about our sin and seeing that fall by the wayside. But it doesn't say just remove sin. It also says that there are other weights and then it identifies especially sin. Meaning there are weights that we carry that slow us down that are not sinful, but they're still restrictive. I think we could probably identify lots of different categories, but I think in the simplest form, if we look at especially what Jesus combats as he is on this earth, he, yes, he talks about sin, but the other thing that gets him really worked up is the weight of religion. It's legalism. He gets real heated with the Pharisees when they are putting on this extra weight, this extra burden that was not necessary, that wasn't the heart of God, that wasn't the, the, the yoke that Jesus came to deliver, that he says that weight of religion is too much. And this is very much the same as legalism. 
is, is the weight and licentiousness is the sin. He says that we, we are to get rid of both. That we're, and so what's important for us to understand is that when we are stripping off legalism, it's not as an excuse to walk into licentiousness. And as we strip off licentiousness, it's not an excuse to now operate in a form of legalism. It's like we're to be continually battling both. No, you keep throwing off that weight of legalism. Yes, you keep throwing off that weight of licentiousness. You've got to keep battling those because they are both tactics of the enemy to slow down not just your efficiency in your own race, but the influence that we're to have on others. That it is in between, it is in the middle, is where God's grace intends us to leave that is most impactful, most efficient in reaching the lost. I do think, though, it does use the word especially in relating to sin. That yes, we're to be combating both, but especially gives us a little bit of a priority to combat sin. That this kind of comes first. Now, this is my own personal opinion as I look at this. But in my opinion, as I see the word especially, I think an outside observer should mistake the followers of Jesus more on the side of legalist than licentious. But at the same time, I think there should be great confusion of they seem legalistic, but they have so much joy, and I don't feel judged by them that my standards aren't as high. I don't feel like they're comparing or that they're condemning. I don't feel like they're a stick in the mud. Actually, they're pretty fun, and they have high standards, and I enjoy being around them, and they actually laugh, and they're not putting these convictions on me that I don't have, that they seem to have. There should be a confusion of why there is a lack of judgment and joy accompanying such high standards. Because we're especially supposed to say, the longer I follow Jesus, the more sin should be dealt with. And it's going to look more like I may be a legalist because standards are growing. Because a morality is on the increase. Because holiness and godly living is, is the direction I'm going. So it may look on the surface that I could be more legalistic. But there should be confusion that they're not saying bad, 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 bad. They're saying, I just love you. I just love you. I know who God's calling me to be. I know the standards on my life. I know the convictions. I know the influence I want to have. So I'm not judging anybody. I'm growing in the grace of Jesus and the direction he has for my life. It says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, we do this, we accomplish this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who both initiates, begins, and perfects our faith. What this is saying is that the longer we're looking at Jesus, who is the answer? We're not just supposed to go out there and perfect our own faith. It is grace that produces faith that leads to good works. It is continually looking at the grace of Jesus, letting that grow faith inside of us, and letting that faith produce good works. But the more that I'm looking at Jesus, the longer I'm following Jesus, the longer I'm in step with Jesus, the more perfected my faith becomes, and faith without works is dead. The demonstration of that faith is behavior, meaning grace should produce godliness. It's a different timeline for everybody, but grace should be continually producing godliness. Grace and godliness are not at odds. They go hand in hand. And sometimes, for some reason, there is tension inside of the body of Christ with, between grace and godliness. No, grace leads to godliness. And we don't have to be ashamed about that. We don't have to worry about, not to, uh, uh, about keeping distant from uncomfortable conversations of sin. Now, we have to major on grace that if you want these areas of sin to change, it is by keeping our eyes on Jesus. And he grows and he matures that faith. But right believing will never make an excuse for wrong living. I think we just have to be bold enough to make that statement. That right believing never makes an excuse for wrong living. It always leads to holiness, but holiness with humility. Holiness, because humility is holiness. If we go into verse 2 of Titus 1, it says, This truth that leads to holiness gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. This truth that leads to increased holy living, as we read in verse 1, brings confidence in one's salvation. Meaning, again, your works don't earn your salvation, but observing your increased holiness can bring confidence in your salvation. It's not how we earn it, but it does give a demonstration. Uh, when you know uh, certain evidence can give you greater confidence in the ending. Anybody watch Free Solo? Uh, it's on Disney Plus right now, and it is just like, it's this guy who rock climbs the face of El Capitan without any ropes, and it is terrifying. Uh, and as we're watching this, this uh, 
this, this documentary, uh, had to keep reminding myself and maybe reminding my wife who wasn't breathing as we're watching this, like, um, I think he's going to make it <laughs> because the evidence is this was a banner on Disney Plus. Like, this is, they're promoting on Disney Plus. That tells me that I'm pretty sure they're not going to video this guy falling to his death and put it on this kids program as you must watch this. So I, don't, I haven't seen the end, but the evidence is giving me the confidence that he's going to make it. Uh, and, and I think similarly in our life today, I've not seen the end, but the evidence that can give me confidence that the end is going to be life and life eternal is the truth is affecting my lifestyle today. It is transforming who I am that I see more righteousness and holiness and godliness inside of me, not because I attain some new level of self-discipline, but because I've seen the grace of God. And, and I wonder sometimes, you know, is the end going to be what I anticipate it to be? Will there be eternal life for me? Well, has, has grace entered my life? Has faith stirred? And is it evidenced by the truth that leads to holy living? And when I can start seeing, you know, I'm far from perfect, but I see this trajectory in my life and a I'm looking more like Jesus than I used to, and, and I, I don't see those same drives and desires of the flesh as strong as I used to. This can bring us confidence in the future by the evidence of today. It says this truth that leads to holy living is what gives us confidence for the future. And in verse 3 it says, and now at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone. We let everyone know how good this gospel is. It is by the command of God our Savior that I have been entrusted with this work for him. I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith, that we share. May God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior, give you grace and peace. Now, we don't have a lot of time to dig into this right now, but I do want to make a brief statement here. This is Paul, who is a Jew, and this is Titus, who is a Greek Gentile. And the words that are used here are radical in the culture. That Paul says, shared faith. He says, our Savior. And he calls him his true son in the faith. And in a very racially charged culture, and in a setting where this Messiah and this good news was supposed to be exclusively for the Jews, we see Paul, a Jew, receive the gospel of grace, and it levels the playing field and absolutely destroys the racial prejudice in his own heart. I want to tell you, with the racial tensions of our world, I do believe, and we've talked about it in weeks past, that we are to speak up for injustice. It is clear in Scripture that you speak up. That what does it mean to stand for justice? And what that looks like for you might look a little different than someone else, whether it's uh, signing a petition or voting a certain way or, or getting educated or having certain conversations or I don't know what it looks like for you, but we are called to speak up for justice. But what we need as a community, what we need as a culture, and what we need as individuals beyond that is we need the gospel of Jesus to enter our lives and level the playing field and destroy all the racial prejudices in our own hearts and in our country. That we, we want to see this racial prejudice end. We, we, and I think that laws are good and we should lobby for equality as best we can and we preach the gospel to everyone. Because the gospel is what levels the playing field and destroys the racial prejudice. Jumping into verse 5. So we've just kind of concluded the introduction. And now here's the first point of action that Paul gives to Titus. He says, I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. Some translations say to set in order the leadership, the elders of these churches. He says, organize and appoint elders leaders. Um, there's a lot in here specifically to the role of elders that I'm not going to get into today, not because I don't want to, but because of, of time. I actually might try to record some bonus content this week and throw it online, so uh, hopefully I have time to do that. Uh, there's a lot here on eldership and, and what we believe about eldership and what's being taught here about eldership and the words that are being used here that I'm not going to get into that I recognize is important, and I'm not trying to avoid anything. I'll talk about any of these conversations. But uh, he says that you are to appoint elders in these towns. Elders are, again, without getting into to the weeds of it right now, they're, they're the leaders. They're the spiritual overseers. They're the shepherds to care for the people. You're to appoint these. I want to tell you again, you are leaders in this launch. That You are to raise up and appoint leaders, and I believe you are here as, as leadership. 
as those to love and to care for and minister to other people of Missoula and other people in Anchor Church. Again, one of our core values is we want to be a church that empowers, that we are building a church that outlasts us, a building that does so much more ministry off the stage and out of this building than it does inside, that we are empowering you and your gifts and your skills and your passion, your vision, your ability to do the work of ministry. We are to raise up leaders. And it says here in verse 6, this is what we're to look for in elders. This is what you're to look for in church leadership. An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife, and his children must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker. He must not be violent or dishonest with money. So he uh, sets this pretty high standard that um, should be blameless. And then he highlights a few specific areas. But I do want to take a second to recognize what didn't make the list that so often makes our list. There's no test to be taken. The resume doesn't include what education, what classes, what studies have you, have you had. It's not a specific gift sets or skills that we see demonstrated here. What we see is character. He says, look for character. You, you can train skills. Look for character. He says, we want, we want to raise up people and put people in places of authority who have character. And what we see here is uh, before you pastor the church, it's pretty clear you pastor the home. So like, look for people who know how to love and shepherd and care well in their own household how to love their wives, how to raise their kids, and without, again, getting into it, this isn't a requirement that you have to be married. Uh, Paul wouldn't have qualified. He, he wasn't married or had kids. Uh, as far as I can tell, Titus wouldn't have qualified. Jesus wouldn't have qualified. This is saying, whatever your household is, if you are married, if you do have kids, you pastor there first. You show integrity. You show character. You show passion. You show leadership inside of your house. Now, I know we have married people here. We've got parents here. We've got single people here without kids. We've, we've got a mix. But you have a local house. And what we are called to do first is the responsibility that God has given specifically to you. How well do you pastor? How well do you love? How well do you lead? How well do you focus and invest in whatever your home is? Before we ever make a call to step up in leadership within the church, in this church plant. Some of you, your first call that you need to hear and pour all of your attention into right now is leading your home. I'm grateful that you would show up and help move some furniture or serving the kids or be a greeter or down the road, we're gonna have all, all types of opportunities for you to lead and to serve, but not at the cost of not leading in your home. If your marriage is a wreck, go pastor your home. If your kids aren't doing well and they need your love and your attention, go pastor home. It's the way that you operate in your home, in your local community, that shows the greatest evidence that you have the ability, that you've got the integrity to pastor, to lead, to be an elder within the church community. It is character inside the home. And some of you, your biggest takeaway, what you need to hear, and is your mission, your assignment from here, is go home and lead. Go home and love Go home and be a minister there. What I do love about what Paul does identify here, which is summed up in the word blameless that's used twice, but then he uses some other uh, issues here, is Paul unashamedly sets a high standard for leadership. He doesn't say God's grace is so great that you don't have to worry about the way that you live. You don't have to worry about character. Just get talented people. He makes it very clear, and he's not apologizing, that there is, there's a high standard for leadership, that somehow it, our lifestyle, our behavior, it really does matter. Not in earning of salvation, but effectiveness in why we're still on this earth, it matters. Looking for high standards, because much damage has been done by the compromise of church leaders. Much damage, has, much hurt has been done. That's why accountability structures are so important. Authority structures are so important. 
and why we've done our very best to, to work diligently. And I'm not going to explain it all to you right now, but you, you can talk anytime about what our authority structures are. We want to have the, the best accountability structures in place because it matters for the mission, for the gospel. It says, look for character. Now, in order to recognize character, in order for your character to be known, it means that being in church leadership allows others behind the curtain of your life. How, do you, how are you supposed to know how someone's marriage is without getting behind the curtain? How things are going with their relationship with their children? How are you supposed to know if they're quick-tempered, if they drink too much, if they're violent, if they're dishonest with their money, if you haven't gotten behind the curtain? I want to tell you another core value we have is community, that we grow best when we grow together. And it is about being known. I'm so convinced that Anchor Church is going to grow, not just in numbers, but it's going to grow in impact. It's going to grow in, in, in influence. It's going to grow in reach, that you individually are going to grow. Your families are going to grow. I believe in this. And the reason I believe that Anchor is going to grow is not just from the content that is coming from a stage. It is going to grow because of the quality of its people. It's going to grow from the quality of you leading your home well. It's going to come from the quality of you knowing others and letting yourself be known. When we actually embrace and live out what community is supposed to look like, not I go to the same church and hear the same preacher, but I'm in community. I'm digging into the word together. People are knowing me, and I'm knowing them. The good, the bad, and the ugly, and I'm loved, and I'm accepted. This is everything that the world is looking for. And we can, when we can get vulnerable enough to say, this is who I really am, this is the character, not my best presentation on a Sunday morning, but who I am, and we start to grow best when we grow together, this church is going to reach and gr make great impact, not because, again, the quality of content, but the quality of people, the culture that we set. We do see that Paul speaks to significant cultural issues. He could have probably talked about a lot more, but he talks about arrogance, being quick-tempered, being a heavy drinker being violent and dishonest with money. Because these were heavy cultural issues. As, as Tucker explained last week, this, was, this is what this culture was battling. Meaning that we as leaders, we gotta be aware of what our culture, our community struggles with and how are we relating to those issues. I think a big question we need to ask is what is our culture abusing? And how am I any different than that? What struggles do those that I'm responsible for those I'm in leadership of, those I'm trying to be a godly example to, those I'm trying to, to have a level of influence in their life, what do they struggle with? And how does my lifestyle in relationship to those struggles benefit or harm how they're living? I think another question we can ask is, how have we seen damage done to individuals, to families, and communities, and how do we relate to those issues? The ones that Paul highlights, I think uh, we could continue as ones that we need to consider in our community. Heavy drinking has done a lot of damage to individuals and to families and to communities. How do we relate to that? Dishonesty, greed with our finances has hurt a lot of individuals, a lot of families, a lot of communities. Violence, arrogance, quick temper. I think it'd be easy for us to add a few things to the list in our culture that maybe weren't as prominent back then. Maybe they were and they just didn't make the list. I think pornography is wrecking lives. It's destroying families. And it is what our culture, our community, is abusing so extensively. How are we any different? It says you gotta stay away from those things that are damaging and destroying. I think a, another one that is really damaging is overworking. It can be patted on the back versus recognizing a lot of people overworking are destroying their lives, are ruining their marriages. It's destroying families and communities. How do we relate to that? That Paul highlights, hey, these are some damaging behaviors of culture, and how are you going to operate differently? Meaning that if our lives aren't looking much different than what our culture is struggling with and abusing, our influence is on the decrease. How do we live an example in these areas? I'm going to ask the band to come up. And what I see in all of this as we conclude today 
said, I really believe that we have to evaluate behavior. We have to evaluate godly living. And I want to make it very clear, again, it is grace of God first that leads to your faith in him. But if you've seen the grace of God, if you have faith in Jesus, we must look at how does this translate to the way that we live, because godly living leads, or the gospel truth leads to godly living. What I see in this, and again, I'm speaking to leaders. I'm speaking to you who God has brought to this church at this time, because we've got decades of influence ahead of us, and we're just in the starting blocks right now. And what causes us to be effective and efficient is casting off legalism, casting off licentiousness, seeking Jesus, and allowing him to grow our behavior in godliness. And what Paul calls out here is that leaders forsake some cultural norms. Then we could say, yes, God's grace will cover this. And it will. But he also says, for the sake of those that you lead, for the sake of those that you love, leaders will forsake some of those behaviors that are cultural norms. Um, how many of you guys have uh, in your house like a, a squeaky floor, a squeaky hallway? You got a wood floor. For us, we got wood stairs, and they're, they're squeaky. Uh, when you walk up the stairs, they, they squeak. Or maybe you got a squeaky door. Um, if you recognize that during the day, you don't even really pay attention. It doesn't change anything about your behavior. You walk up those squeaky stairs or down that squeaky hall or close that squeaky door without a second guess. But parents, you, you'll for sure recognize this. When the kids fall asleep, everything changes. <laughs> You walk down that hall a little bit gingerly. You've recognized these boards that are less squeaky and you kind of hop around. I'll be honest, when the kids are asleep and I'm walking up or down the stairs, I look ridiculous. You know, it's just tiptoeing and you're trying to just be super cautious or if you're trying to close that door. It's very, very different the way that you're behaving. Now, part of me could say, you know what, kids, I bought this house. This is my house. Them are my stairs. I'll walk up them however I want because they're my stairs. But the reality is, is that we all adapt and adjust certain behaviors because we care and we love those that we're responsible for. I don't want to wake them up. I don't want to disturb them. Do I have the right to walk up those stairs how I want? Sure. But do I understand that I will adapt my behavior to care for those I'm responsible for? For sure. And a huge question I want to ask as we're jumping into this series that, yes, is going to stretch and maybe make us uncomfortable. and Maybe you don't want to be a leader, but you're here. The question I want to ask as leaders in a church plant, building towards what God has for the future of this church and this community, is are there areas of my life that are not beneficial, are not helpful, that are areas that our community, our culture is abusing, and can I be willing to adapt certain behaviors to care for those I'm responsible for? This can come in so many different areas, and I'm not even going to dig into it right now. But are there areas of your life that you can adapt, you can adjust, not because you're not free to do it, but because you care and you love and you believe in the vision that God has for your life? the influence that you could have on this community for what God is building in this church. Would we hold loosely and say, God, I'll give this up because you love people. And I want to demonstrate that for them. Would you stand with me? I want to highlight once again as we conclude, there is danger in legalism. There's danger in licentiousness. We do not make adjustments and adaptations to now walk a legalistic stick in the mud, pointing out all the bad lifestyle. I think the danger that we could approach in this series is that we walk out of here just trying to try harder, just do better. I'm going to have new disciplines. I'm going to stop doing those things. I want to tell you that right living is always rooted in right believing. And right believing is always rooted in the gospel. It is I fix my eyes on Jesus and he perfects my faith. That any area you see that God, I, I would love to see adjustment and growth and maturity, it comes by you fixing your eyes on Jesus. The greatest call is not just to go out and try harder. The greatest call is what does it look like for you today and tomorrow morning to lean into Jesus? 
to talk to him, to listen to him, to go on a prayer walk, to open your Bible, to, to worship him in your own car? What does it mean to say, Jesus, I, I need more of you. I need to see the gospel again. I need you to stir faith inside of me that will produce this changed lifestyle. We go back to the foundation of truth. We fix our eyes on Jesus. It comes down to knowing him, that knowing him leads to sustained change. Lord, I just pray right now as Anchor Church, and uh, we're in a, a different season in so many different ways. We're in a different season with COVID. We're in a different season because we're uh, in a brand new building that we're, we're working on making some adjustments to. We're in an odd season because there's not children's ministry currently. We're in an odd season because we are a church plant. A lot of stuff is still getting in order. And I know that uh, even this, this series right now, it's, it's probably not going to be the norm of series that we preach because we're only in this season once. And so we're going to talk about this now. And I believe, Lord, that you are going to work in a deep way. That this is going to be some foundational digging into our own hearts, our own lives. That's going to set the foundation for effective ministry for decades to come. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to do the hard work that we'd be willing to be uncomfortable. We'd be willing to ask ourselves the difficult questions. Lord, I, I pray that we would recognize that we are ministers. We are leaders. Leadership is influence, and we all have it. Lord, help us to recognize the leadership you've placed in our lives. And that as leaders, we make decisions not just to benefit us, but we make decisions to be the most impact for those that we're responsible for, that we're caring for. Lord, some of us, that starts in the home. Lord, before we ever put in more time and effort and energy to, to lead within the church, let us lead within our homes. Lord, I just pray that Anchor Church will be known for godly marriages, healthy marriages. That Anchor Church will be known for godly parents, not because we've all studied it enough or because we've gone through certain trainings or classes, but because we have been seeking you, Jesus. You're transforming us, you're growing us, and we recognize the responsibilities that you've given us to lead in our homes. God, I pray that we would not be ashamed of high standards, but God, that we would not be comparing. We wouldn't be accusing. We wouldn't be judging. We wouldn't be belittling. We would continue to look inwardly and say, God, there's work to be done in my heart. I need the gospel to continue to transform the desires of my flesh, that we don't look outwardly. We look inwardly and say, God, keep changing me. Lord, I pray that we would build a community, a culture of being honest, of being vulnerable, of being known. Lord, I pray that we would ask the hard questions of, Lord, what, what is it in my life, what is it in our culture that, that is hurting families that I've been participating in, and what do I do about it? Lord, I pray that you would call out some of the difficult stuff in our hearts today and through the course of this series. And, Lord, raise up leaders. Lord, let us have greater confidence in who you've called us to be, when you've called us to live, the community that you've placed us in. Let confidence arise. We're not just depending on somebody else. We are leaders. We are ministers. And we will not just go to a church to be ministered to. We will be a part of a community where we are ministering to them. Lord, make that mindset, mindset shift in our hearts and in our, our lives. Lord, we love you. Lord, we pray for any of those that are listening today, either live or tuning in later, who've yet to put their faith in you. Lord, I pray that today would be the day where they experience your grace. The grace would just invade their lives. They would feel your love. They would come to a new understanding of the gospel that at their worst, you gave them your son, that you gave your very best, that they don't have to earn it. They don't have to deserve it. They don't have to try to work hard and behave in a certain way, that today they can receive your grace. And I thank you that that produces faith that leads to a godly life. We just say welcome to the journey. Anyone who today is seeing faith stir up in their hearts as they see the grace of God. 
Father, we love you. We're so grateful to be in community together. Thank you for the days that you have ahead for Anchor Church. Well, we hope you enjoyed that message. We pray it blessed you. If you'd like any information on Anchor Church or to get connected, go ahead and visit us at www.goanchorchurch.com. We will see you next time and we hope you have a great rest of your day.